grab a play or just like to read a good book, I think you'll really enjoy today's program. Our special guest is Meg Wallacer, and she is a best-selling New York Times and other places author. Um, she's written a lot of adult books, and this is her first children's book, uh, The Fingertips of Doug Big North New. So I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about the book. But there's a character in there with a very special power, and I think you'll enjoy finding out about that. So let's introduce and welcome Meg Wallacer. Thank you. Although, in, do you know that they don't have the little numbers next to them? Do you know why? Because they were afraid of getting sued by Scrabble. <laughs> <laughs> they made them look like Scrabble tiles, so they didn't do that, I think. I think so. I'm making that up. But, but they did make them just sort of look like Scrabble, Scrabble letters. Um, but Duncan Dorfman is a kid who has a Scrabble superpower. Do any of you have Scrabble superpowers? No, nobody here? All right. Well, I'll tell you what the Scrabble superpower is, and I have a little slideshow and all kinds of stuff. Duncan Dorfman is a boy who feels that he has really nothing special about himself. And he moves to a new town and with his mother, he's a single mother, and they live in their aunt's house. Um, and he discovers he has the ability to read things on flat surfaces without looking at them. Nobody here has that, right? Okay. No. So if you have that ability, why would that be useful in Scrabble? Did anybody say? Yeah. Um, well, maybe when you're picking the things, you can tell what letters you're going to. Right, you can tell what letters. And do you know what letters might you really want to pick when you're playing Scrabble? Yeah. Letters, like rare letters, like Z and Q, for example. Absolutely. You know, Z, Q, X, and J are the four highest point tiles in a Scrabble set, they're called power tiles, and they figure largely in this book. Also, there are two really unusual tiles that are not like any other tiles. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Um, the blanks. The blanks. You might want to pick the blanks. If you, if you could feel things without looking, and you felt nothing on the surface, you might think, oh, that's a blank. I've got to have that. And then there are four S's. And the S's are really, really great because when you make a word, if a word is on the board, suppose the word jam is on the board, and that's a high scoring word because that's eight for the J, one for the A, and three for the M. You could add an S, you've made jams, you get all of that plus your new word, steering. And if you use seven tiles, all seven on your rack, do you know what you get? A 50 point bonus. So these all kind of come into play in this book. But before I talk, and I'm going to read and I'll ask some questions maybe about Scrabble, about writing, about what you like to read, I have a very, very low-key uh, show. A little. Now, I hope it's, uh, it'll be sort of dark enough in here to see. Is it possible to lower a light yeah. point just to sort of, so we can see who's there? Um, this is my dog. I don't, he's kind of <laughs> hidden in shadow a bit. Um, but what do you think his name is? Yes. Jet. Oh, you are very smart. Yes, this is Jet, who we have used for this purpose. Now, this is my older son, and here is an anagram of his name. Now, did I name him real big? No. <laughs> that would be very humiliating, right? All right. Mm -hmm. All right, that's really his name, Big Earl. Did I name him Big Earl? <laughs> I think not. All right, everybody close your eyes and see if you can make the letters in Big Earl Move around to make a boy's name. Does anybody see it? It's a little hard. Somebody's okay. Yes. It could be kind of like Gerald. It could be kind of like Gerald, but that's not all. This uses all the letters. I'm going to give you a big hint. It begins with a G. It's very hard. It's tough. And I'll give you another hint. The second letter is an A. <laughs> yes, somebody has it. Oh, yes. Is it Gabriel? Let us see. Oh, it is Gabriel. Very, very good. All right, good. 
So this is Gabriel, my poor children. I was going off on book tour, and I was all set to leave, and I had my book with me, and that's all I had, and they said, Mom, you can't go on book tour without bringing a PowerPoint. And I'd never even known how to do that, but I did. So the night before I left, my children were forced into servitude for this. Okay, here is my other son, who I will talk about, because he has a very, he actually won, the, won a writing contest here many years ago, the, uh, the Young Writers Award, and that was very exciting. But he then moved on to playing Scrabble. And did I name him the chair? No. <laughs> that is ridiculous, right? Archie L. Sorry, these are kind of blurry. This was night before book four. What do you think? Okay, his name is not the chair. It's not Archie L. Any idea? Yeah. <gasps> very good. Very very good, Charlie. Now you're really starting to get into the anagram kind of swing. All right. So oxyphenbutazone. Charlie wanted me to put this up here because this is a real word. This is a word that when he was playing Scrabble, he dreamed of playing. <laughs> He dreamed of getting this. But now, you might ask yourself, how could you get this word? Because how many tiles are on a rack in Scrabble? Seven. seven. So this is clearly much longer than seven. However, if some little words were already on the board, you could maybe add to them. Can you see any small words in here already? Yeah. Zone, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But, which always gets, yes, <laughs> a laugh. All right, but, and yes, what do you see? I see him. Hen, right. So there are little words in here that can be turned, that if you added to them, you could potentially make oxyphen use of, but it's never happened in our family. Um, snifter pig. Is this a word? What do you think? No, it is not. However, it is an anagram. It is a perfect anagram. If I use all the letters in snifter pig, I can make one word. And I'm going to just give you a hint. It's a word that's very dear to my heart and, the, and my book. Scrabble? Not no. Scrabble. Um, take a look at the book. All right. Oh. Um, <laughs> now remember what, what Duncan Dorfman can do. The fingertips of his hand. Yes. Fingertips, yes. That is fingertips. And I just love the way letters can move around and words can make other words. And we'll talk about that too. There's fingertips. All right, Harry and Potter. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to make, if your name was Julie, and you made that in a Scrabble game, your opponent would say to you, I challenge you, because proper names are not allowed. However, Harry and Potter, while proper names are both also words. Potter, you know what Potter is, right? A ceramicist. Harry is a verb, it means to bother somebody. So I'm just giving you a tip. You could make the word Harry, and it would be good in a Scrabble game. Now, here's some words. Zek, what do you think? Real or fake? No? Good. Mo, what do you think? Fake. No? It's good. These are all good, so remember these. Okay. For the little. For what do you think? Fake. No. No, it's also good. It's also good. And not only is it good, if you took off this R, if you took off the third R and just did BRR, that also is in the Scrabble dictionary. So it's kind of amazing. I didn't know any of these things. You know, I grew up playing Scrabble like a lot of you do. And my mom, I played with my mother, and we had no idea that any of these were words. Had I known this back then, my game would have been much more powerful. Now I'm going to give you some anagrams now that you're really kind of into it here. These are all food anagrams. It's not tractor. When I put this up, somebody always says tractor. But it couldn't be tractor because I'm missing the T, right? But it's a, it's a food, yes. Carrot. Absolutely, good. Grab Guru. Doesn't that sound German? Yeah. Anybody see it? It's a food. Yep. Very good, yeah, mm -hmm. very good. All right, lovey. Yes. Very good, this is right, olive. Okay, pager. Yep. I can't fool you. That's right. Great. Now this one, chin wads. <laughs> chin wads. If you eat a lot of these, you'll get chin wads, I guess, right? There's something interesting about this, because I spoke at a school this morning. This one takes a while to get it. And you know why it takes a while to get it? Because I think in your mind, you think that it's a plural, and you're going to keep that S at the end of it. However, what if I told you 
that the S had to be at the very beginning of the word. Would you get it then? Yes. Anybody got it? Sandwich. Yes. Very good. Right. Um, sandwich. So here's Charlie holding his trophy, and I'm going to talk about that in terms of the book. But we started going to Scrabble tournaments that he entered, and he did really, really well. And here is my, well, this actually was for the school. You'll see why. If we can translate this. You're not a school. Pretend that the last word is library. But what did I say up here? Thank you for having me to your school. Now, the reason I used a blank down there is because there are only two H's in Scrabble, and I used them both here. And I'll leave you with the final image, which is of Jet <laughs> <laughs> saying what? I thought that would be a great Christmas card in here. Okay. Um, so that is my slideshow part. And now I want to talk about the book a little bit and read a little bit. Um, is there, is this a clean glass? Yeah. Oh, great. Excellent. Hang on. Let me get some water. So, so Charlie, aka Archie L or Le Chair, started playing Scrabble, and we realized that he was really good. And I loved to play with him, and my mother, who I played with, played with him as well, and we really, really enjoyed it. So we went to a Scrabble tournament because it turns out that if you're between the ages, if you're between fifth and eighth grades, you. Uh, can enter the National Scrabble Tournament, which is so great for kids. And I went with him, and they play in teams, and he went with his partner, Anatole. And they did pretty well. They didn't win or come close to winning, but they did nicely, and they loved it, more to the point. And it was 100, 100 teams from all around the country. And uh, they met kids that they never would have met otherwise, and it was pretty wild. And I thought, this is a great idea for a book, because we love Scrabble. And if you write a book, you should really write about something that you care about a lot. And one thing that I've discovered as a writer, and I'm, I'm curious if we have some questions, um, if you agree with this. Of the books that you remember most, I think you think about, you remember character, really, more than you even remember plot. So it was very, very important to me that I had characters that we really care about. So Duncan Dorfman, well, from the name Duncan Dorfman, what kind of a kid do you think he is? Do you get a sense? Yeah. Kind of weird. Yeah. Kind of a little weird. Yeah. Average. Kind of average. You guys, it's like, you, and you didn't read the book? And you're not my own children? I didn't plan to hear it? Okay, that's great. That's right. He thinks of himself as having nothing special. But I really became convinced that every kid, and every person, really, adults as well, has something about them that's just a little unusual and interesting. And I, just, for him, I give him this Scrabble superpower, but he doesn't know it's a Scrabble superpower. He just knows it's a weird power. But for some reason, his mother has told him not to tell anyone about it. She's worried about it, that he can read things on flat surfaces. So I'm going to read you a little section when Duncan decides he feels like such a loser at school. He's just moved to school, this new town in a new state, and he has absolutely no friends. And he feels like he has to tell somebody about what he can do. There was another new kid that fall. His name was Andrew Tanizaki, and he had a face like a tired old man. People sometimes called Andrew the Chinaman, despite the fact that his grandparents were originally from Japan, and that Andrew and his parents were from New Jersey. Duncan Dorfman and Andrew Tanizaki sat together every day at lunch. No one else came to sit with them. It was just them, Duncan and the Chinaman, sitting across from each other in the cafeteria at 10.45 a.m. with their damp red trays. If only Duncan liked Andrew Tanizaki more, but this was what the conversation between them at the lunch table was like. Andrew, do you play the video game Star Pod Defenders Team Zero? Duncan, no. Andrew, well, I do, and I beat level 12. Only two other players in North America have done that. One is five years old. The other one has no hands. He was born that way, you know, handless. Duncan, oh. Then there was an awkward silence, except for the chewing of food. The chewing went on and on. One day, after they sat uncomfortably like this for a while, Duncan finally stood up to get himself a glass of apple juice. And as he walked across the cafeteria, he felt something go slap against his back. He reached around but didn't feel anything. He just got his juice then and walked back to his seat. 
There was distant laughter and the sounds of people shouting, but Duncan paid no attention. As he reached his table, though, the shouting became harder to ignore. Lunch meat, people were calling out. Hey, lunch meat. After a few seconds, Duncan Dorfman realized they were talking to him. He stood still, his face growing pink, but he had no idea why they were saying this or what it meant. It was as if the kids at the school shouted strange, random words at new kids in order to freak them out. Maybe in previous years they had shouted at other new kids, hey, blowfish, or hey, monkey wrench. But then Andrew Tanizaki stood up and hurried over. Um, Duncan, you have lunch meat on your back, he whispered. What? Lunch meat. Duncan reached around himself again, feeling all over the places on his back that he could reach. This time his hand found the edge of something cold and damp, and he pulled it off slowly and fearfully as if taking off a band-aid. Someone had flung a piece of bologna at his back, and it just stayed there, sticking to his yellow shirt. And now, like Andrew Tanizaki, a.k.a. the Chinaman, Duncan Dorfman had a nickname too, Lunch Meat. Just as the lunch meat had stuck to his shirt, the name stuck to Duncan. Yo, lunch meat, kids said to him every day at school. Even a sixth grade girl who had seemed to be a nice person called him that one day. Her face formed into a little sneer. After a few days, kids stopped calling out to him so much, but still the name was there. Life was joyless, that was the best word for it. Duncan slogged through the days, but inside him, it was getting to be too much. On a cold, slushy morning in October, Five weeks after school began, sleep was pinging the windows outside the cafeteria, and someone across the room was calling out, hey, lunch meat, and Andrew Tanizaki's jaw was biting down squeakily on a hot dog. All of it finally became unbearable. Duncan wondered if there was a way out. That was when it hit him. In order to have a decent future at Drilling Falls Middle School, he had to ignore what his mother wanted. Sorry, Mom, he said to himself. And then he sat up a little straighter and told Andrew Danzaki, I have a power. The words were forbidden, but it was almost as if he hadn't said anything at all. Andrew barely looked up from his food. Yeah, right, he said. I do. Andrew took his pinky finger and reached deep into his own mouth, trying to loosen a tiny piece of hot dog skin from between the tight clamps of his braces. Then he folded his arms across his chest and said to Duncan Dorfman, show me. Give me something to read, Duncan told Andrew. Why, am I boring you? I don't mean to read to myself. Come on, give me something. Andrew reached into the clogged backpack that he took everywhere with him and pulled out a creased little booklet. It was a Star Pod Defenders video game instruction manual. Andrew had doodled cartoons all over it. Pictures of alien heads floated everywhere, all of them with long antennae coming out of their straight black hair. Now open to a random page, said Duncan. Okay, said Andrew, here. There was silence, or at least there was silence at their end of the table. Duncan closed his eyes and turned his head away as Andrew opened the booklet. All around them, kids talked and shouted and laughed. The seven-foot-tall cafeteria giantess blew on a whistle, and Duncan heard her yell, If you do not sit down, young lady, you will have lunch with Principal Gloam. After a second, Duncan realized that the sounds of the whistle and the voices were fading. It was as if he and Tanizaki were on a train carrying them far away from Drilling Falls Middle School. Duncan felt the fingertips of his left hand go warm, then warmer, then actually hot, as if he had one of those hand warmers in his pocket that his mother used to buy him. Now, just the way that it had happened in the bedroom at home, the fingers of his left hand became so hot that it was as though his brain was sending his fingers an urgent message. Must have heat. They grew so hot they began to hurt, and soon they pulsed as though someone had slammed a car door on them. When it seemed as though he couldn't stand the heat any longer, it leveled off and Duncan let out his breath in relief. Are you okay? He heard Andrew Tanizaki say. Duncan just nodded. With his eyes still shut, he ran the fingertips of his left hand across the surface of the open booklet and read aloud, FAQ, question one, what happens if I reach a new level and get stuck inside the mind vault? Answer, if you reach one of the master levels, you should feel proud, but for those who are really impatient, cheats for reaching the next level can be found inside the Cone Star satellite. Duncan paused, and I also want to add, Andrew, he said that you drew some doodles there, am I right? There was no reply. Duncan stopped talking and opened his eyes. The world seemed as bright as a superstore, and the sounds of the cafeteria rolled back toward him. 
He turned to face Andrew, who just sat staring at him, who then muttered in a shocked voice, Yeah, you're right. What the heck is this, Dorfman? What the heck is this? So that's where he's shown his ability. And what happens is that the kids at the next table who are in the Scrabble Club hear this. And Duncan is sort of drafted to be in the Scrabble Club and to go to the big tournament where the top prize is $10,000, which is actually what I believe it is, so that he can reach into the bag, pull out the best tiles, and win. And Duncan, because he's a good kid, feels really conflicted about doing that. But you know, we've had conversations about whether or not that's a morally okay thing to do. Because for instance, what if you had an ability in chess, were some of you chess players? Yeah. Okay. What if you had an ability to see 10 moves ahead and your friend could only see two moves ahead? Should you be allowed to play because you have this ability that your friend doesn't have? So he has this ability to do something. He's not keeping, he's not looking, he's just feeling the tiles. Do you think it's moral for him to reach into the bag and pick the best tiles? Who thinks it is that it's, it's okay to do that? Does anybody think it's okay? Okay. And who thinks it's not okay? Well, Duncan struggles with this, and I'm not going to really say what happens, but I will tell you that he meets two other kids who become his very close friends at the tournament. One is a girl named April, because I really, you know, I have two sons, and I wrote this book for Charlie because he became a big Scrabble player. But, and I have Gabriel, AKA, real big, or the girl. Um, but I wanted to have a girl character in here. It's important to me um, to represent the girl side of things. So I have a girl named April Blunt. And she's very, very different from Delta Wolfman. She loves Scrabble. She's already a big Scrabble player. But she is somebody who grows up in a family of jocks. And they don't respect Scrabble. They don't think Scrabble is a sport. She says it is a sport. It's the sport of their mind. She also has another reason to very, very much want to go to the Scrabble tournament. And I'll tell you what it is. Have you ever gone anywhere with your parents? to like a motel or even just to a park in the afternoon and you meet a kid there and you just start playing and you never know the kid's name and then your parents say it's time to go and you go and you never actually see that kid again. Have you ever had an experience like that? You have a really fun time with, a, with somebody you meet, right? How would you ever find that person again if you didn't know their name, knew nothing about where they lived? Could you ever find them again? Well, April, this day, that she goes to a motel and she meets this boy by the side of the pool and she teaches him to play Scrabble. And she thinks that maybe he's stuck with Scrabble and he'll be at the Scrabble tournament and she'll meet, see him again. Because she really, really liked him. They became good friends. And she wants to see if she can see her friend again. That's the other reason she wants to go. But the third kid in this sort of trio is named Nate. And he's completely different. He hates Scrabble. He hates it. He loves Scrabble. To him, Scrabble is like the worst smelly cheese in the world, the worst thing you'd ever want to eat, the worst thing, like the hardest subject. He hates it. But the reason he is going to the tournament is because his father is obsessed with Scrabble because 26 years ago, his father went to the same tournament and was winning. And at the very last move, his father and his father's partner lost the game and he never was able to get over it. Can you imagine that 26 years later, still being obsessed about a game he lost? His father wants to avenge his loss by having his son win and reclaim the honor for the family. So Nate, all Nate wants to do is skateboard. He is a big skateboard freak. And he lives in New York. But he plays Scrabble and his father pulls him out of school and is homeschooling Nate so that not only can Nate learn math and geography and reading, but guess what his father makes him do all day? Yeah, Scrabble words, right? Study Scrabble words. And actually, in this book, kind of, sort of interestingly, there's a, there are quite a few Scrabble words. Um, and I have to find what page that is. But here, like, there's one, in one part, there's a list of the two-letter words, and it takes up a few pages. Um, oh, what page is that? 44. Okay, let me show. Okay, actually, that's, that's a different kind of page. 70, thank you. Okay. All right, here's the two letter words that are good in Scrabble. It starts here, it goes here, it goes here, it goes here, and then it goes to there. And some of them actually were recently added to the Scrabble dictionary. 
If you're serious about playing Scrabble, go to a bookstore and buy the Scrabble Dictionary. It's red, it's got a red cover. Do any of you have that in your houses? Um, because this shows you the words that are good in Scrabble. When I started learning the two letter words, I could not believe some of the words that are good. QI was added a few years ago. It's pronounced qi, and it's a, it's, a, it's a Chinese word for kind of energy. They also added za, because they said that it was short for pizza. Do any of you say, gosh, I'm so hungry, I want a za? No, I think that seems so weird. But there are a lot of words. If I'm telling you this, even if you get nothing out of else out of coming here today, if you look at page 70 and learn that list of two-letter words, your game will improve so, so much. It really, really will. Um, so, but back when I was playing with my mom, we didn't know any of this. But I've become a much better player, and I really, really love to play. Now, I'm going to give you a choice. I can read a little more, or we can have some questions. Do you have anything? Do you guys have some questions? About writing, reading, scrapbook, playing? Do any of you want to be writers? OK, we have it. All right. Yes. When you were about 10 or 11, did you think you might want to grow up and be a writer? I, or what kind of kid were you? I totally wanted to be a writer. My mother is a writer, and I think that helped a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was somebody who, I had a teacher in first grade who used to invite me up to her desk. Um, she was like my secretary. I would say, like, take, I would just dictate stories to her. She would write them down because I had a really bad handwriting, and I still kind of do. And she would write them down in her wonderful, fast handwriting. We have them to this day. I always wanted to be a writer. I always did. But I thought that there were actually jobs. I thought that there was a job, you could get a job naming streets. I love to come up with things. Like, I have a, a diary in which I just kept ever green in circle. I wrote these in street names. And I realized that that's what a writer does. Um, I told myself a story walking to school. It was about twins who were the heirs to the Kraft cheese fortune. They were billionaire twins. And where did that come from? Do any of you here want to be writers? Some of you, OK. Good, good, good. Well, if you have some writing questions, then we can have some few questions and I can read a little more. Yeah. Do you write freehand now? Do you write on a computer? How do you write? I only write on a computer. Yeah. I mean, I totally made the leap. Yeah. You know, it's not all that different, really, writing for adults and writing for kids, because characters have to be really vivid. Those books that you love, think about it. Think about the characters in Harry Potter. Think about Charlotte's Web. Think about Harry the Spy. Any of the things you love. That's true of novels for adults as well. Um, I think it was having kids that made me want to do that, because I read so many great kids' books. There was one that I loved so much when I was growing up. All of a Kind Family. Did anybody read that? Yeah. And I remember, okay, now I read that about 100 years ago. I can tell you what I remember. Sarah wouldn't eat her rice soup, and her mother kept putting it on the table in front of her every day until she ate it. They lost a library book, and they were so freaked out because they were really poor, and they would have to pay the fine for that. Um, and that they nibbled cookies. Do you remember this? They got bags of cookies that were broken from a, from a candy and cookie shop. And they lay in bed at night. And the oldest sister, Ella, told them, OK, now take one of the chocolate ones. Two bites. This is how they made it last. It, you know, they were a poor family on the Lower East Side, I guess. And it just I believe these characters so well. I remember them to this day. There's not that much different. The subject matter is different. But if you like the characters, I think you're in good shape. That's my sense of it. Um, any other writing questions or reading questions? Yeah. yeah. How long did it take you to write the book? It took me about a year and a half. And one thing I wanted to do when I was writing it was make sure I got things right. So when I was doing the final, final edits, actually, um, my editor sent me the pages you know, that were like looked like the book. And I spread them out on my bed. And then I went and I got that Scrabble set. That's a really, I don't know if some of you played on this before, but this is a great Scrabble set that's at the Lazy Susan It Turns, and it's really kind of great. I took that Scrabble set, and I put it on my bed, and I took the letters and the, the tiles in the Scrabble set, and I played every move that I played in the book to make sure I didn't get something wrong. Because that's just the worst kind of thing. You know, somebody writes in and says, that move is really only 18 points. <laughs> 
And then you feel really stupid. So I played the whole, all the games. I, I played as much as I could. There's a lot of big games, and uh, there's some anagrams in here. There's a really cool anagram that I learned when I was growing up, which is if you take the letters in gross mules, and you move them around, they make a common word, one word. And in the book, um, when April meets the boy who she calls Pool Boy, Mystery Pool Boy, because she doesn't know his name, she gives him that anagram. And then she never sees him again. And she wonders, did he figure it out? Did he know it? Does he know what it is? Um, do you, and I'll tell you what it is. It's in the book. The answer is somersault. And I thought that was so amazing. I think I could sit there forever and never see that Rose Mules is somersault, but it really, really is. There are some other amazing anagrams of long words. Um, you know maraschino? Does anybody know what maraschino is? Those cherries that nobody likes, right? Um, that supposedly cause cancer, except maybe not anymore, I don't know. But maraschino is also a perfect anagram of harmonicas. Now, you might say, this is the most useless information I've ever heard. But when you're a writer or even a reader, you love the way language can be played with. There's something really exciting about it. And in the book, actually, it's not just that you learn quirky Scrabble words, but actually, I, I decided that if I was going to write a book about Scrabble, it, first of all, it's not a book about Scrabble, it's really a book about kids. I mean, you want to know who wins. And I'll tell you that one of the teams does win. Um, but you really don't have us anymore. <laughs> Alright, so people who want to hear who wins, the other people can go la la. No, I'm not going to tell anybody who wins. Although I was in a school in San Francisco, and these two boys came up to me and they said, Tell us, we won't tell anyone. And I was so stupid, I whispered it to them. And then they turned around and they shouted it to their class. I couldn't believe that they did that. But um, I, I wanted to use words to solve the mystery, because there's a mystery in this book, not just who wins. But Duncan, who feels that he doesn't really know himself or what's great about him, kind of learns some things about himself through some of the words that are played on the board. I know I don't, do we have time for me to read a little more or shall I just, shall we uh, leave it? We have five or ten minutes and then we'll be time for signing. I think people want to thank you for All right, well then you know what, then maybe a couple more questions I think would be a little, a little better. Yeah. Well, in my school, it, when, in your school, did they have these crazy reading levels that were like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, K? Um, they had something or, called SAR. Anybody remember this? Yeah. It was colors. And they had, okay, and when you were like a beginning reader, it was the most basic colors. Like I remember this boy Jimmy was red, and I was like, oh, he's a red, you know. And I was like, olive. Because they went into more obscure colors, but the more, the harder they got, the most, bo the more boring they got too. They were terribly boring. Um, is that? Do you have something like that? So, no, we do letters. Like A is the worst, and Z is the best. Oh, so and they give you things to read at the different levels. Yeah. No, I. Did you want to? Yeah. Say anything more about that, or just? No, we didn't have. I think we had. You know what S A R is? It came in a box. But, All right. SRA. 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 Right, thank you. SRA. Sorry. See, I, I remember everything about all the kind of family, but not the tormenting reading thing. Another question? Yeah. Um, how many books have you written for kids? For kids? All together? Um, all together. All together, you know, it's a, I've written different kinds of things, but it's like around 10, something in that range. I, I've been doing it, I sold my first novel. Um, since when I was in college, actually. And it was really, I, you know, I was 21, and I was in college, and I wrote a novel. But I wouldn't have done that if I didn't have a mother who showed me that it's something that's just as legitimate as, as any, any other job. And, it, and it's what I love to do. So um, I've written a lot. Yeah? When did you learn how to play Scrabble? I learned how to play Scrabble, you know, badly, I guess, when I was your age. How old are you? No, and it's exactly what I was going to say. I, my mother and I used to go to um, the town pool, and we would play Scrabble, and the box that we have from there, and also from the beach, has suntan lotion spots all over it, like oil <laughs> spots. It was the same you know, box that we took with us everywhere, probably the sand in it too. When did y'all, 
there's something called junior scrabble that I never understood. You just sort of put them down. It doesn't really have that much. I think you're all, I think you all could play a great game of scrabble. If you turn to page 70 and use the two letter word list, you would be surprised. Like AA is a word. Um, AA is a word. Like who would know that, right? But it's good. Let your opponent challenge you. Because you know, challenges are very exciting moments in Scrabble. But I started playing it around age nine, and I played just, I think you kind of either grow up in a game family or not. Like we played a lot of Scrabble. Uh, we also played uh, Monopoly, my sister and I. It was long, long games. But my family, with my own kids, we played Scrabble. We also played Clue a lot. And I'm terrible at Clue. My son, my older son, was always got it right. My younger son would win Scrabble. We all had something that we were good at. I think Scrabble, you know, sometimes even if you don't win, if you make a really cool word and letters, like one thing that I love to do is if you put the X, which is an eight point letter, on a triple letter mm. square going two ways, you're getting 50 points right there and you're gonna maybe win the game. Mm -hmm. Now it isn't really about winning, I mean in this, in the fingertips of Duncan Dorfman, who wins really matters because they each won it for a very different reason. Duncan wants it because he wants to be seen, he wants to go back to school and feel like he has something important. He wants to go back and win the championship for his school so that they don't think of him as a loser, lunch meat. He can't bear to be called lunch meat again. That's what he wants. April wants her family to know that Scrabble is a sport to her. And Nate wants his father to let him go back to school again and not be homeschooled anymore and have his father get over his obsession. So they each have a burning desire. I'm not going to answer it, but who do you think would win? With me as the writer making that decision, who do you think I'm? Yeah. You think April? Who thinks April would win? April and partner. And who thinks Nate, the skateboarder? Fewer. And who thinks Duncan? Interesting. I didn't, you know, somebody asked this morning when I was at a school, do you know what's going to happen when you get to the end of the book? Do you always know? And I feel like it's more kind of like, you know, you have an idea, but you don't really know. And you have to be, allow yourself the flexibility of changing it a little. I wasn't really sure who was going to win. But I knew it had to be a very, very exciting scene. And then I realized something important plot-wise, and I knew who would win. But I, I let it sort of happen kind of naturally. Um, yeah. Scrabble yeah, Scrabble question. Yeah, Scrabble question. If you challenge a word and then it turns out the word is actually a real, real word, does anything happen to you? Yes. You're taken out into the woods. And you're <laughs> <see it. laughs> you know what happens? You lose your turn. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And actually, in the yeah. tournament, it's very exciting in the book, too. There are these oh. computers. And, okay, picture the tournament, which is held down in Florida. And if some of you are in fifth to eighth grades and are interested in going with a friend to Scrabble tournament, you don't even have to be good. You just have to like Scrabble a lot and practice. Um, they have these computers set up all around a huge ballroom. And they're word challenge computers. They're open to a word challenge program. And you walk up and one person types in the word. It's so stressful. I watched Charlie and Adam stand up with these other two kids that they've never met before. In one case, like two little girls who were like half their height walk over to a computer and type something in, and I could see from across the room, the screen popped up red. It would be red if it was wrong, and it would be green if it was, the word was okay. Um, it was very exciting to see a challenge in action, but it is kind of tense. Uh, another Scrabble or writing question? A reading question? Yeah. When you first learned Scrabble, did you really like it, or was it sort of an environment you really like it, but it's sort of fun? You know, I just, no. I, I liked it. I didn't take it seriously. I just kind of goofed around with it. I went actually to my kid's school to have a little Scrabble club, and they knew so little about Scrabble that a kid made a word diagonal and thought that was acceptable. Um, but that's fine to begin that way. I just like words, and I think if you like words and you like reading, it's really cool like to see something on your rack and to move the tiles around. You know what you can even do if you like playing Scrabble? Reach in, if you don't have the Scrabble superpower, reach in, put seven, Put seven letters on a rack and move them around and see how many words you can make out of what you've got there. I didn't like it. wasn't a passion yet. Absolutely not. But I liked it. Yeah. yeah. Um, my sister, she loves playing um, Scrabble Junior. And recent, um, like, a couple, like last year, I got this mini Scrabble.
travel set. Oh, yeah. And, um, Oh, I have that. Yes, it's a travel yeah. set. That's great. Yeah, because you can take it away if, like, in a, for a car ride or a vacation or something like that. It's really the only thing. Sometimes you, you have to have a hundred. You have to check, count them at the end of your vacation or your car ride to make sure you still have your hundred tiles. Yes. Do you have a question? No. Yeah. Is it? if you don't do what those, what those boys did in San Francisco. Yes. Did your mom want you to be a writer? Good question. Did my mom want me to be a writer? Be a writer? Yeah. She really did, actually. She liked that I was a writer. And I, there was a magazine called Kids Magazine that doesn't exist anymore. It was so great. My mom read about it in the New York Times. They did an article. It was a national magazine, and you have to be under 15 to be published in it. And she said, you should send something in. And I did, and they accepted it, and I got five dollars, which was a lot of money for me, and they published my story, and I illustrated it as well. She loved it. I mean, we grew up in a house with no writer. There's, I don't think there's a writer on earth who didn't like reading when they were kids. You know, it doesn't mean, it's not a logic problem, it doesn't mean that all of you who like to read are going to end up as writers at all. But we like reading, we like writing. Um, my father even told me a series of stories in bed at night about a character named Alka Seltzer. I mean, you know, it's like you have weird family stuff like that. If books count, matter to you, and stories, and you like telling yourself stories, that's a great way to start thinking about being right. But she did. She did like being right. Yeah. Yeah. What happens if they don't? If it's a red, if you are allowed to use the word, but they don't say challenge. Oh, and it stays on the board. In fact, I was looking at some, when, I, when you're a parent and you're at the Scrabble tournament and you can see, these, the parents are like forced back behind a rope, of, like behind like a velvet rope, like a paparazzi, you know, and they sit there and they have to be really quiet. But if you can see somebody's board and you see a phony on the board, you know, you can't say anything and it could stay there the whole game. The thing is though, when a phony stays on a board, it kind of ruins, Here's what, here's what could happen. Suppose you made a phony word. Suppose somebody made the word um, blick, B-L-I-K, okay? And nobody challenged it. Later on in the game, everybody thinks it's good. Somebody's gonna make blicks. But maybe now somebody thinks, wait a minute, I bet blick wasn't even good. I'm gonna challenge blicks. You know, you start, once you start with leaving a phony on the board, it, it kind of makes the board ugly. That's what Scrabble players really sort of think about. But yeah. Fake words stay on the board all the time. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, what happens if like you're the challenger and um, the word is good? Like um, if you challenge somebody and the word is good, you lose your turn. Your next turn, they go again. Yes, the word stays on. The word stays on the board. They they pick again and they go again. And you know that actually. Well, I'll just tell you another thing. A big challenge is part of the turning point of a plot in this book. There's a huge thing having to do with a, a, a word challenge that Duncan is absolutely positive is good, and it turns out not to be good, and he's shocked by it because it has something to do with his own life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes. Me? Yeah. Um, well, I think that there are some words that are really good for Scrabble, and those words are usually scientific words, because there are all these crazy words, and like, like, I know, I've seen a word, it's the chameleon cells that help it change color, and it starts with an X, and it's like eight letters, and it would be really? a really good Scrabble word. It's, you know, some people do study the Scrabble dictionary, that's how they get to be good. Um, they get, there are, uh, there's another thing, there are a lot of Q words that don't take a U, and there's a whole list of them in there. K, Q, A, I, D is actually good. Kanat, I think, Q-A-N-A-T, that's also good. Kintar, Q-I-N-T-A-R, but also, and Kindar. I don't know what they mean, I can't tell you what they mean, but sometimes it's actually important to know what they mean, because then you could know if it would take, for instance, here's a good example, if it would take an S at the end, right? Like, um, L-O-C-I is, okay, does anybody know what that means? Yes. Yes, what does it mean? Well, it means uh, places in Latin. So it's, well, it's uh, plural, it's a plural. Oh, locus, right? Locus, which means right. place. But if, if you put it down on a board, 
and you didn't know it was already a plural, and your okay. opponent added an S, you know you're going to challenge that right off the board, right? Mm -hmm. So you, if you knew that, so it is a good thing to kind of know some of the words, but like, I think AA means cindery lava. You know, it's weird. It's just it's weird stuff. And I just like knowing the weird words. I think the characters like that too. Um, yes? Um, my sister, she writes in her school newspaper. And then there was also this magazine she gets. It's called Stone Soup. Oh, I know Stone Soup. It's and great. Then it's for writers, and she yeah. sends off a thing. And so once, two months later, so she wrote, she wrote an article in the newspaper, and then two months later she shows it to us. Yes. So would you say that's normal? That it took her two, <laughs> that it took her two months to show it to you? I would say that a lot of things are normal, and I think she felt self-conscious about it. You know, everybody, you know, sometimes, do you ever feel that way when you have to stand up and read something? Right, you know what I'm talking about, right? I think some people, look, Writers come in all types. There are people who can't wait. You know, they always have their hand up first, and they're, they always want to read their thing first to the class. And maybe it's not even that good. And then the shyest, oh, this reminds me of a book that I love. Does I even, all right, here's a little trivia thing. It was about a girl who, who ends up moving away, and she leaves, and she always was talking about all the clothes, the beautiful clothes that she had, but she was very poor. And at the end, yes, the hundred dresses, right. And she left behind all these incredible drawings that she'd made of these dresses. And she didn't show them to anybody. So I think people are weird about their work. They sometimes like to show them. They sometimes don't want anyone to see it. I think your sister sounds like a writer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Do you have any particular advice that you give to young people that might think they want to be writers? Yeah, I would say um, write about the best advice that I ever got from a writing teacher was write about what's important. And by that, that doesn't mean you have to write about global warming. You could write about what you know something that really bothers you, something you care about. If you write with a certain kind of emotion, I think that it will feel stronger. Do you have to do creative writing exercises for school? Do you ever sit there with a blank page, not knowing what to do? Yes, right? You know what I'm talking about? One thing that I find really helps is if you come up with a title. I've never heard anybody say this, but this has helped me. If you come up with a title for what, it, what you're going to write about, then you almost can gear it toward that title. Even if you don't know what it's going to be. Like, why would I call it the chameleon sweater? <laughs> and then you write, then it forms. Your brain is so strange that it can go in directions that it can then help you come up with something. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to feature articles, and it's nonfiction. And we're doing nonfiction and we're reading it, and like half the class doesn't like reading nonfiction or writing nonfiction. Right. But when they let us cho choose our thing, everyone must like, jump to the thing they did best. The thing that they did best. Yeah, I think people do really gravitate to the thing that they, they do best. I'm a big fiction person. I love novels. Like I. I would really, I mean, I'm probably limited that way, but I really, really love reading novels. And when I was a kid, because my mother was a writer, the library that we went to, they let us take out more books than other people. I felt like we were celebrities. <laughs> and I would like, but I would, we would leave, we, on Friday nights, we grew up uh, in Syosset, which is on Long Island, exit 43. And we would go to the next town, Plainview, because they had a really good library with very good children's room and a great fiction collection. And I would take out like a stack of books this high. First we would go to this Chinese restaurant, and then we would go to Baskin Robbins, which was new then. And then we'd go to the library. And my sister, even in the car, in the dim light of the car on the way home, I'd be struggling to read the books that I took home while eating my ice cream. So that's how you really become a writer. You like to read, you play Scrabble. I'm telling you, all these things kind of go to the same place in some way. Um, should I take a couple more? Or yeah, and then if you want to follow up individually, you can do that. Yeah, as well. absolutely. Okay, okay just a, a couple more. Okay, so um, we haven't heard from here. And then, yeah. Me? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the title of the box. So there's this book that I heard about. It's about this family who doesn't have that much money. Mm -hmm. it's, called, it's, it's something about like a hockey sweater or something, a hockey jersey. And so this boy for Christmas, he really wants a hockey jersey, but his mom's poor, so they save up all their money and buy one, but then the, the, but then the people at mail 
send them the wrong one. And he has to, and he has to wear that at school. And I don't know what he's called them like it. But yeah, that sounds like a great premise for a book. Because one thing I heard about what makes books good, somebody wants something and somebody does something. And somebody really wants something in that book. And I bet they end up doing something about it too. That sounds really kind of sad and good. Do you know what it's called? I don't know what it's called. But I, I'm a pretty good Googler. And I could, I'm going to try to look it up for you. And I'll leave a message at the front desk of the library. I'm going to find that for you. But maybe Carrie knows. I can find it. Yeah. Uh, first, to hear back here. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite word? My favorite word. When I was when I was about eight, my favorite word was carrion. C a r r i o n. And then I learned it meant dead meat. I didn't know that. I just thought it was a beautiful sounding word. Um, I like the word ambidextrous, which means being able to use two hands. How about you? What's your favorite word? Um, I don't know. I was going to say, I think you, I thought you'd have the answer to that because it's an interesting question. Yeah. Like you were saying, like, um, you like somebody wants something, but they don't get it, so somebody has to do something. In school, I just, it was like, if you somebody wanted, but so, so somebody wanted something, but, um, but something happened, so they do something else. That's a great assignment. I love that idea. Somebody, so it's somebody, somebody wanted, wanted, but so. so. Wow, good they teacher. Wanted. Nice. That's very, very good. Um, all right, well, maybe we should end there. And But there are Scrabble sets around, and I'm happy to do a Bobby Fisher thing and walk around a little bit. Um, if you want to follow questions. Yeah, follow questions up here.